Welcome to the First Unitarian Fellowship of Nanaimo. My name is Lise Smith, and I'm this morning's service leader. Whatever your ethnicity, theological belief, gender, sexual orientation, age, and everything that makes you who you are, please know you are warmly welcome in our community. If this is your first time with us, a very special welcome to you. If you are joining us on Zoom for the first time, please, we invite you to share your contact information with us so we can introduce you more to our community. We have a wonderful website, ufon.ca, and invite you to check it out for more detailed information about who we are, the services we offer, and how you can connect with us. We acknowledge today that we meet on the traditional territory of the Shnunemak First Nation. As Unitarians, it is, we are committed to the work of reconciliation required to address the harm done to indigenous people and their cultures by non-indigenous peoples. We've much to learn from the indigenous perspective that the earth is the source of all life and that our responsibility is to honor and care for it. Our speaker this morning is Welm King. Welm is an entrepreneur, business manager, having founded and managed businesses in fields, varied fields, law, agriculture, artist management, and song administration. He currently assists people explore and shift their relationship with mortality as a death, death coach, death doula. He is also the program manager for the Nanaimo Climate Pledge, which will be launched, launching next month. He's published two books, including a national bestseller, and is currently drafting his first novel. In his spare time, give me a break. <laughs> he climbs a lot of rocks and enjoys the simple pleasures of life with loved ones. Welcome, Will. It is now time for the announcements. Today's photo is courtesy of Bob and Debbie Goodman. They're multicolored tomatoes tomatoes from their garden, and they wish everyone a happy harvest. Did you know that the fellowship is a fragrance-free zone? Some people have severe adverse reactions to scented items, including laundry, laundry fragrances, soaps, shampoos, and colognes. As we contribute to the fellowship's welcoming environment, we ask that each of us be respectful of other sensitivities, including scents. And an announcement from the Environmental Justice Committee. The posters are ready for the committee's panel on November 12th, Surviving and Thriving as a Climate Activist. And we need your help putting them up. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board at the back of the hall with a list of locations for posting. Let's paint the town green. And our last announcement is that today at 1 o'clock at the Bebbin Activity Room, Bebbin Park Activity Room, uh, will be the celebration of life for Barry Farrell, if anyone is interested in going. I don't know exactly where the activity room is, but I'm sure it will be fairly obvious. To find out more about special events, groups, and meetings taking place in the fellowship, either go to the calendar on our website or read the weekly update sent to you by email on Thursdays. Now, I always need this. I invite us all to take a deep breath, get rid of the business busyness, that has been, <laughs> you saw the bustle this morning. Let's all take a deep breath. I invite Patrick to lead us into worship through music. Good morning, everybody. Um, decided to try to combine a few themes as well as the season so um, I'm going to play for you a bit of a tribute to Dia de los Martos, the Day of the Dead festival in Mexico. This is a, this is a waltz by Mexican comp composer Juventino Rosas called Sobre las Olas, which is, translates to Over the Waves. Um, funny, fun fact about this, it has in the past been mis misattributed to Strauss because of the way it way it sounds but here we go it's by uh, again over the waves by juventino rosas <laughs>
Our opening words this morning are by Barbara J. Peskin. For the beauty of this earth, this spinning blue ball. Yes, Gaia, mother of everything, we walk gently across your back. To come together again to this place, to remember how we can live, to remember who we are, to create how we will be. Gaia, our home, the lap in which we live, welcomes us. Please read the chalice lighting words on the screen. <laughs> this flame is a promise that we are smallness in a short time on this earth, but we live immensely in the evening with love for one another, with honesty and integrity, to be guided by rational thought and critical thinking. So our first song to sing together this morning is uh, All Creatures of the Earth and Sky. It comes from our Gray Songbook, number 203. I'd like to invite Catherine Jane to come up and help me uh, song lead this one. So uh, thank you to Debbie for sharing the, the lyrics on the slides. And uh, as always, uh, please uh, stand as you're willing and able and after I play the melody once through. Here we go. you to uh, join me in a sung meditation this morning. We're going to be singing uh, Mother Earth, Beloved Garden from our blue book, number 1067. 
Um, as usual, I'll play the melody and I'll invite you to join me for three verses of this song, and after which there will be a minute of silence, followed by just a little bit of piano music. invite Wilm to come up and share his thoughts with us. What a great group. 
really. It's my first time here, and it's really, what a great group. This is really delightful. You know, in thinking about what I wanted to say today, I started thinking about my own story, and we all have our own stories. We all have that, that, that place where we draw a line in the sand, and we say enough is enough, and what a beautiful intro with this Greta children's book. I mean, what an inspirational human she is. Wasn't expecting it, didn't know that was coming, but what a perfect intro. You know, for many of us, we don't really look at the tough stuff until it hits us. And so I work with people in the world of death and mortality, and a lot of people don't think about death until it hits them in the face, whether it's their own or one of their loved ones. But it, whether you think about it or you don't think about it, we're all going to die. And everyone we know is going to die. And that's how it goes. But the people who do think about it, they tend to be better prepared. They tend to be able to face it within themselves and within others with more grace, with more dignity, with courage. And it's similar with the climate. The climate crisis is going to impact every single corner of this planet, whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want to face it in advance or not. But the people who do look at it, just like the people who look at the, the, the reality of death, they gain some advantages. They're more likely to be prepared on just a tangible level. But more than that, it's been said that the only cure for climate anxiety is climate action. And the people who look at it are prepared to take action. So what's going on in the world today? This is what's going on. This cut off Victoria last year. This is the Malahad Highway. This was Lytton was a small town in BC that was for a time the hottest place on earth it was in BC and it just combusted. This was Merritt, a bigger town. 7,000 people were evacuated, the entire town. Many have not returned to their homes. Just last month, Halifax, 400,000 people, hurricane. Miami, just last month, 400,000 people, hurricane. Brisbane, some of the worst flooding Australia has ever seen this year, 2.3 million people. And then it gets really bad. Pakistan is the fifth most populous country in the world, 240 million people, seven Canadas. Their flooding that's taking place in Pakistan right now is covering about one third of the country and has displaced more than 30 million people. That's the entire population of Canada, simultaneously not able to be in their homes. And then, you know, last year we had this crazy heat dome in BC. This year we were spared that. We had a horrific drought, but we didn't get the crazy heat. The UK did get the crazy heat. Just some samples of some of the temperatures unparalleled in the UK, and that pales in comparison to India, where I'm not sure if you can see the, the guide at the bottom right, but everything you see on that map that looks black is hotter than 50 degrees Celsius for weeks on end. This is what's happening in our planet right now, today. So I wanted to share a little bit about my own personal story before we dive a little deeper into this. Um, as uh, was wonderfully said, thank you so much. I, I've done a lot of things in my life and I continue to do a lot of things. And during the period of time where I've been working in business and various types of enterprises, I've also been really interested in what's going on in the world. I've been studying the economics of the world, the environment of the world. I have a really interest, deep interest in sociology and particularly in food and food politics and local food and things like that. And in 2017, I was living in South Nanaimo, which is where I live right now. And I walked out of my house one morning into a Martian landscape. I'm not sure how many people here or listening at home can remember this, this feeling, but it was the worst year of forest fires that we've had in BC um, in, in history, I believe. And there was a morning I walked out and it literally looked like a Martian landscape. The air was this kind of dark, thick, black pink is the best way I can describe it. The sun uh, looked completely unrecognizable. It looked like a, like a putrid pink disc through this apocalyptic haze and it 
it struck me in a place that was so much deeper on a terror level than anything I've ever experienced. It was in my reptilian body. I, I couldn't logic it away. I couldn't think it away. I understood what was happening. And it was so terrifying to me, and it reverberated for weeks and months, even though the, the smoke eventually cleared. But it wasn't the line in the sand for me. The next year, I took a job for a major multinational corporation as a senior business advisor. And between 2018 and 2020, I flew more. Oh, is this OK? I'm a little close. Yeah. I flew more in those couple of years than I have in the rest of my life combined. And I've traveled a fair amount in my younger years. Clearly, the line in the sand wasn't drawn, even though I had this deep, deep terror. But in 2021, the line was drawn for me, and it came from two sources. The primary source was the heat dome. I, again, was living on my property in South Nanaimo, and the heat dome we experienced last year made it so abundantly clear that it's here now, that we can't avoid it, and it's probably going to get worse. The other thing that happened was the pandemic, and the pandemic was not caused directly by the climate crisis. But what I witnessed was, firstly, how fast things can change. We like to think that it's going to be this kind of slow, gradual process. But things can change overnight. Suddenly, our world is different. And it was also interesting to see how divisive things can become. And so those two things, the intersection of the direct impacts of the climate crisis and the pandemic, was my line in the sand. And I realized I need to work in the climate crisis world. I need to put my skills towards the climate. That's what matters most. There's many things that matter, but nothing matters more. As Greta says, if your house is on fire, it doesn't really matter all the other things. That's the only priority you have, or if your house is being flooded. So I learned two things that inspired me to work in this field. One is what I've already said, the cure for climate anxiety, which we all feel, or we all should feel, the only people who don't feel it are people who aren't paying attention, is climate action, doing something. And the second was really an interesting one. I was listening to a podcast, and I was listening to this brilliant scientist who said, you know, the thing to understand about the climate crisis is that it's not a binary issue. It's not black or white. So I'm going to say something now, which is probably not what you're expecting someone who works in the climate crisis to say. But if you asked anyone else who works within this field and they give you an honest answer, they would say the same, which is this. We are going to lose the climate battle. In fact, we've already lost it. If you look back at the first major conventions, Paris, Kyoto, things like that, what the science said was that we have to keep our climate to a maximum of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. We are currently at 1.2, and what the science is saying now, that science hasn't changed, by the way. Science has progressed a bunch, but that hasn't changed. The 1.5 didn't change. What changed is that we didn't change. And what science is saying now is that maybe we can keep it under 2 degrees. So what was previously the ceiling, we absolutely must keep things under 1.5, is now our basement. We've already lost. But what's important to know is that this is not a black and white issue. So here's the analogy I like to use. If you're a hockey fan or any other athletic endeavor or something like that, but let's use hockey. If your hockey team loses by two to one and you look at their season record, they have a loss. They lost two to one. If they lose by 20 to one and you look at their season record, they have a loss. It's the same. It's not that way with climate change. The difference between a 1.5 degree and 2 degree is quite large. The difference between 2 and 3 will be measured in billions of lives and massive percentages of species going extinct. And the difference between 3 and 5 might be the habitability of our planet. It's not a black and white issue. And to put that in perspective, that 5 degree number, the last global ice age was about 50, 60 million years ago, was 5 degrees colder than our current temperature globally. So that's what five degrees means. Five degrees down is a global ice age. So what's five degrees up? So that piece of knowledge that, that the cure to anxiety is action and that this is not a binary issue, that the goal is not to win here. The goal is to lose as little as possible because we're gonna lose, but we can lose better and we can lose worse. 
and we should be doing everything we can to lose better. Oh, one sec here. How do I do this? Oh, there we go. My TP lessons. <laughs> okay, so what am I doing about it? I started a project in March called the Nanaimo Climate Pledge. It was originally called something else, but this is the, the new title for the project. The goal of it is to empower households and individuals to lower their personal climate emissions. Everyone needs to do their part. Government, business, individuals, households, across the board. I would like to argue that the most important group of those is individuals. And most people think it's business or government. Why individuals? Because we elect the government and we buy the stuff business makes. They're not making that stuff for themselves. There's not some evil corporation that's just pulling oil out of the ground for its own sake. We buy it, we use it, it's us. And so as we start to change our personal actions, it will impact all the other things, how we vote, what choices we make in terms of what we buy, what our lifestyle is, how important that trip to Mexico is, et cetera, et cetera. It all starts with us as individuals. In BC, 17.5% of our provincial climate emissions come from households. It's the second biggest group. The only group that's bigger than households is the pulp and paper industry at about 20%. Here's an interesting fact. It used to be thought, and this is just a logical thing, that in order for any group, whether this is here in this congregation, in Nanaimo, in BC, in Canada, for there to be some kind of a tipping point, the point where we're, we're going to change our direction, it makes sense logically that it would be 51%, right? We're majority, that would be the tipping point, et cetera, et cetera. It's not. It's actually about 25% of any group. If you can get 25% of any group to do something on side, the rest of the group will actually tip over with them. So we don't have to aim for 100% to make changes. We have to aim for 25%. Here's what we're targeting in our project. We're targeting a group that we call the middle majority. So if you look at a population, let's take Nanaimo, we, we loosely break it down into three groups. On the one side, you have a small group of people, let's call that 10%, who are aware of climate change, are aware of its impacts, are aware that it's gonna get worse, and most notably are taking substantial action personally to do something about it. They are doing the heavy lifting for all of us right now. On the flip side, you have a small percentage of the population, it's probably bigger than the first, let's call it 20%, who are unlikely to do any substantial work. They might be climate deniers, they might have completely different belief structures, they might be into some kind of weird theories or things like that. Neither of those are our target market for the Nanaimo Climate Pledge. What we are striving to aim for is this middle majority. We define that as people who also have some awareness of climate change, who also have some awareness that it's impacting things right now and is likely to get worse, but for one reason or another, haven't taken any substantive action yet. That's who we're trying to approach with this project with the Nanaimo Climate Pledge. Phase one, it launches actually two days ago, technically. Our website went live two days ago, uh, and so it's, it technically is launched. Until next March, the target area Greater Nanaimo area, we're loosely defining that as Lady Smith to Qualicum Beach to Port Alberni, including Gabriel Island. We're partnering with UBC on this. About 10 years ago, UBC declared a climate emergency. And one of the things that came out of that was they created a program called the Sustainability Scholars Program. We have partnered with them in that program, and we're working with a PhD student who's going to be doing all of our data analysis, which is very important to us. What are we doing? We are taking the same message and we are approaching people from five different methods. These are the methods. Clubs, groups, organizations, such as the Unitarians today. Through schools, we're gonna give our brochure to students and ask them to take it home to their parents to discuss. Through cold mailing, we're gonna pick up target neighborhoods and do just cold mailing. You'll just receive a flyer in the mail, completely unsolicited. Deep canvassing, similar to cold mailing, but we're gonna give it in person, knock, uh, knocking on doors and through climate connectors, and that's what I want to touch on the most today. What's going on here? There we go. Phase two, next year. Our hope is to take what we learn in phase one, to refine that data, and to expand it throughout Nanaimo. Phase three, all of BC. 
That's our goal. 25% across BC, we can turn this province into a completely different direction from the ground. So what's the pledge? What am I talking about here? Okay. This is the pledge. So I have these with me today. This is the inside two pages of our brochure, which I'm hoping many of you will take. It lists 12 different actions. Technically, there's 13 here, but we combine them and, and spread them apart in different ways. 12 different actions that you can take to make a substantial change. These actions were selected out of many. There's many others that also matter, but we think these are the most important, either because they have the greatest direct climate impact or they're among the most common actions that people can take easily, such as write a letter to your MP or MLA, things like that. It's really important to note that when you look at this, and again, I know there's a lot of data there, this is something that's not designed to be consumed in a, in a quick slide, that the CO2E savings, which you see on the right side, are relative to one another. And so the goal of that is for you to be able to say, okay, well, what does it mean if I drive a little less? What does that actually mean? How does that compare to if I fly a little less? How does that compare to if I change my diet? How does that compare to if I change how I buy clothing? And so we wanted it to be very relative so people could make informed decisions easily. So what are we asking people to do? What am I specifically asking you to do today? We would like you to join us. We would like you to take the pledge. And that's really a four part process is what we recommend. This is optional in how you do it, but this is the what we recommend. Firstly, talk to some people about it. Hold a meeting, talk to the people in your household, talk to your family, talk to your friends. Don't feel like you're in it alone. Hold a meeting, form a group. This is a great group, but it's a big group, form a smaller group. <laughs> then make a plan, take stock of what's going on. Use our information and look at your life, be honest about it. What are you actually contributing and what can you do about it? Make a plan, then take the pledge. It's really important if you want to support us that you actually physically take the pledge. It's online. It only takes about five minutes once you know what you want to do. It's very quick. And the reason is, is that's how we can collect data. And right now, collecting data is the most important thing for us to learn what works so that we can effectively spread this to more people. And then lastly, if you want, promote the pledge. So how can you promote the pledge? Great question. I know everyone is just asking, that. how can I promote the pledge more? So. When I was asked to give this talk, I was told, you know, this is a this is a pretty enlightened group here, just so you know, you're not gonna have to go into too much detail about things. And so I haven't in terms of what's happening on the planet. But I want to just give a little bit of math here. I said before that what our goal is is 25%. So there's about 100,000 people in Nanaimo. Here's how that math actually breaks down. There's 30 people in this room. There's, I don't know how many people listening at home. Let's just say there's 50 people watching this right now. If 100 people share this with three people and those three people share it with three more people, if we do that to five generations, that's 25,000 people. The people in this room and watching this right now, if everyone took this on and connected with three people and we went through five generations of that, just three people, that's 25% of Nanaimo. That's our tipping point. That's how much power we have right now. So what's a, what does it mean to be a climate connector? And I know this is just at the tail end and it was actually the title of my whole talk, but the climate connectors are one of the branches that we are testing and one of the ones that we think will have the most efficacy. And so this is what it entails. It's quite straightforward. You will take our training. I give the trainings personally. They're done by Zoom. It's a three hour session. I'm trying to get it down to closer to two, but right now it's three. And what we ask is that you take our brochures and we, you distribute them to 20 people you know and offer to have a climate conversation. And a lot of what the training is about is how to have a climate conversation with people. And that's it. That's what we need and that's what we're asking for. And most importantly note, it's, it's even in big letters. You don't need to be an expert. We're not training you to be an expert. You don't have to have all the answers. What you have to have is a passion and a curiosity and a desire to help. And that's it. You're a community member having a conversation with another community member about the most important issue in human history. And we hope that you'll consider that. These are our contact informations. I have lots of brochures with me if anyone would like one today. 
and I would be really uh, happy to answer questions. I was asked whether we would do a Q&A, and I said yes. I don't know if that happens now or later. Later? Okay, great. And uh, Or just chat afterwards, and I really appreciate it. And uh, like I said, this, is, this has been really delightful for me to be here today. I appreciate it very much. Thanks. All right. Well, it's now time to sing uh, what I think I can safely call our favorite song. This is uh, number 1064, Blue Boat Home. Um, as always, thank you to the uh, slide sharers for the lyrics. And um, please uh, stand as you're willing and able and, and join me in singing Blue Boat Home. <laughs> The Greening Tree Project is your opportunity to tell us your stories about what you have done that might be called climate action. Anything counts as long as it is, it is as <laughs> I can say this, as long as it is recent. The stories can be about a minute long. We can do a couple of people a week, and you are encouraged to do more than one story over the course of the year. Does anyone wish to tell their story today? If you would like to to please uh, raise your electronic hand on Zoom or come to the mic at the front of the hall. I don't see anyone on Zoom. I'll do one. This uh, the Greening Tree Project is is our form. <laughs> Greening Tree Project is our form of the climate pledge in their little group, but. Uh, the, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Environmental Justice Committee, which this week signed a pledge or, or not, a letter 
from a bunch of groups that is asking the provincial government to try and stop having uh, natural gas hookups for new buildings. And we've been quite involved in doing that for Nanaimo already, and they've agreed to it, but now we're expanding it to the province. So on behalf of the Environmental Justice Committee, we have a new little step in the right direction. That's wonderful. I have Dorothy Mandy online. Oh. Okay, there, there, there are such large projects to be done and happening. So I, I'm going to just mention that uh, I support my partner as he's working through trying to make uh, heat pumps for homes actually affordable. There are huge grants, but they tend to be eaten up by the, uh, the people installing them. And the process is complicated and not at all as it should be, and he's working very hard with other other people and lobbying and uh, trying to get that to be affordable. In my own little way, I've come up with a tiny, tiny leaf. So I'm going to share that with you. This past week, I had I found I wanted to send out thank you cards, so I went to my stash of cards and I didn't really have any thank you cards. But what I did have was a whole mess of beautiful cards that have been sent to me over the years. I have trouble throwing things away. And so I am repurposing all kinds of greeting cards and they will be my thank you cards. And I'm hoping this will catch on and maybe we will save a little twig on a branch, on a limb, <laughs> on a tree. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my leaf. It can be tiny. <laughs> you might feel like your leaf is just a tiny flutter in the wind, but it will help strengthen our tree, and in turn, our tree will help build a forest towards a just, safe world for all. Now that we're both online and in the hall, we welcome your donations and pledges in three different ways. First, we've set up the Unitarian Fellowship Bank account to automatically deposit e-transfers into info at ufon.ca. Second, you can write a check and pop it in the mail. And third, if you're in the hall, there's a basket at the back of the room where you can place your donation after the service. Our charity today is the Ministerial Discretionary Fund. If you'd like to donate to today's charity, please note that on your check or e-transfer. We are grateful for your offering. As we are nearing the end of our service, after we sing Carry the Flame, and I go back into my office so I can do this, we, you have an opportunity to join a social group. This is for breakout rooms. There, will, there are breakout rooms that will be available, as I said, when I go to my office, and they'll be available for about 30 minutes after the service. In the hall, we're setting up for snacks and social time, and Wilm will be here to answer questions, hopefully. So thank you for your participation today. I'd like us all again to take another breath. Our closing words are two quotes from David Suzuki. Nature surrounds us from parks and backyards to streets and alleyways. Next time you go out for a walk, tread gently and remember that we are both inhabitants and stewards of nature in our neighborhoods. We emerged out of nature, and when we die, we return to nature. We need to know there are forces impinging on us that we will never understand or control. We need to have sacred places where we go with respect, not just looking for resources or opportunity. Now I invite you to please read the, well, I guess. Do we have the extinguishing words on the slide? Oh, okay, never mind, I'll read them. <laughs> we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. So now, uh, sorry, Lisa, did I just take, take the floor? <laughs> <laughs>
take the floor. <laughs> well, it's time to sing Carry the Flame, so please, everybody, um, get yourselves organized. I don't know what I don't know what's normally said there. <laughs> well, hold hands or bump elbows or whatever. Yes, that's right. If you prefer to bump elbows, that is accept totally acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. The words are up on the wall if you need them. <laughs> 